I'm Ned Smith, and I work for Intel. As uh, you can tell from the slide, I'm working in the Open Technology Center for Intel, and my background is in security. I've been spending most of my time working with the Open Connectivity Foundation, defining the security uh, model and the set of uh, an object uh, uh, object model for for uh, OCF there. And uh, what I wanted to talk about today was gateways and some of the challenges that, that gateways present in the context of doing software update. Uh, if you are not familiar with OCF, they're, they're uh, defining a, an IoT framework. I'm going to go into more detail about what, what a framework is and so forth, so uh, <coughs> don't worry about that. But uh, to get started here, I um, just wanted to uh, introduce some, some sort of the big picture in terms of the software update process, just so that we're all on the same page. Uh, and then uh, I'll, I'll go into more detail in terms of how this, how the, how the IoT frameworks fit in the context of software updates. So, uh, just to just to introduce some of the some of the ideas here, in terms of this process, you can you can uh, consider that many of the many of the products that are delivered today in IoT and other spaces are are essentially built from contributions from a variety of different suppliers. Uh, those those suppliers provide um, uh, functionality that is fed usually to a vendor or an OEM who is responsible for that product, right? So presenting the entire uh, a solution to the to a user community, and in that context, they're going to provide some additional um, support in terms of, of building the product, testing it, and then producing a manifest or something that is signed for secure for secure reasons, uh, which then is. Uh, put into some sort of a package, uh, given to a, some uh, some sort of software update distributor. In other words, some way for that that update image to be uh, communicated to the the uh, end device. Then there's uh, the notion of an update installer. This is this is something that is going to be able to uh, unpackage that uh, image and present it to the to the target platforms. There may be multiple platforms that 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 installer is, is, is targeting. So in this context, there's manual update, there's over-the-air update, there's a variety of different ways to do update. I'm not trying to focus on any one particular way to do that, uh, just really to talk about it more generally so that we have some context for, for uh, update process. Now, uh, as, I, as the topic alludes to, the, the idea here is to, of this talk is to help understand, well, what are the complexities of of op, uh, software update in the context of a gateway. And so to better understand that, we need to understand, well, wh wh what's the complexity of it just, just doing an update in the first place? Uh, when we talk about a target platform, there's, there's update that can happen at various levels, uh, even at the lowest levels in, in the CPU level. There's microcode updates that typically uh, have to go out. <clears throat> we don't often see that. You know, many vendors don't, don't see that because it's sometimes uh, taken care of by the BIOS or the uh, the the, uh, the uh, OEMs who are providing firmware updates, and the microcode updates essentially get bundled in with the with the firmware updates. The, but then there's on top of that there's system software updates. Those are uh, uh, sometimes there there can be framework updates, and application on top of those frameworks uh, uh, are also need to be updated. And the reality here is, is that there isn't one, there may not be one update mechanism that satisfies all of those needs for, for the different types of, of software update. So what you end up with is multiple kinds of containers for packaging up the update, multiple types of distributors, whether it's an, an, an app store model, or whether it's, uh, whether it's the uh, uh, update mechanism that's provided by the operating system vendor or the OEM. These tend to be different. And then, of course, there's the installers. There's a variety of different technologies for installers. And if anybody's been following any of the, the update path uh, for this conference, there's been you know, a variety of different installer technology that's been discussed. <coughs> and of course, at the very end are the devices that are the targets of the update. Okay, So the point here is that 
you know, every, every single platform build is going to have a target that's going to, that potentially is going to have multiple update infrastructures that it has to uh, uh, address in order to, for that update to be uh, applied properly. So another, another focus of this talk is around you know, interoperability through standards, and, and there are several standards that are driving an IoT framework. So you, you may be, be familiar with some of these. There's the Open Connectivity Foundation. There's uh, OMA, UPnP has been around for a while, uh, but it's still, it still fits in this category of a uh, IoT or IoT-like framework. Alcyon Alliance is another one. One M2M is another one you may be familiar with. And there are others. This is just a few. There's, there are a lot of these out there. <clears throat> and if we are trying to get to the, to the nirvana of uh, you know, IoT interoperability, then we need to talk about translation gateways because all these protocols need to be translated uh, at least at the semantic layer. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, translation is essential to interoperability. Uh, and there's really no way around that. So this, this, uh, the focus of this talk primarily is at the IoT framework layer. There's all these other layers we could talk about and have been talked about in other parts of the, uh, the conference. Uh, this talk is going to focus more on the IoT framework layer. <coughs> and uh, uh, so this is, this is the, you know, at the, the above the operating system, below the application kind of level. Uh, there's, uh, I also in the, the, want to point out this notion that there's a single image. Uh, many, many of these constraints, constraint, uh, many of the constrained devices are built around the notion of a, just creating a single image. So, uh, and in that scenario, there are, uh, there's still an IoT framework component that's embedded in that image, uh, uh, and, uh, but the image itself has the need to, to go through this translation layer. And so, that becomes that be, that I think becomes an interesting aspect for update as well. I'll talk about it a little bit more. Uh, I'll talk about it more a little, little later. Uh, but the the takeaway here is that the IoT framework layer is really rich in semantics, and so when we're doing translation, it's it, translation is all about gaining access to that semantic layer and doing a semantic mapping, and that has to be done in the clear. Uh, so there's there's really no opportunity for end-to-end -end security, for example, uh, and so the the IoT so the, the translation gateway becomes a trusted third party or a trusted entity in the whole end-to-end uh, um, -end security model. <clears throat> so let's take a, a closer look at the uh, object model for for it, for interoperability for many of these IoT frameworks. Uh, just to introduce the, the notion of an object model, if you're, if you're not familiar with the lightweight M2M model, they, ha they basically define this notion of clients and servers, and they communicate to one another through interfaces. The server is def has, has its own um, object model where they, de they define these things called objects, and those objects have attributes, and then the interfaces define um, you know, how to interact with those objects by the client. This is typically done over co-app. In uh, the OCF model, Iotivity has a, a sort of a similar but different approach to an object model. They also define clients and servers and interfaces for interaction, uh, but they have the notion of resources, and then resources have properties uh, that, but otherwise, there's, there's quite a few similarities between the two object models other than than sort of this naming difference. Uh, there's also the all join uh, object model. It, there they, they refer to consumers and producers and they interact uh, with one another through routers. They define interfaces that are essentially logically similar to objects or resources in the other models. And then they define methods, signals, and properties as the, 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 the type of data that, that interfaces expose. The whole idea behind these frameworks is to get interoperability between the clients and the servers. Okay? So the idea is that there should be different vendors producing clients from those vendors that are producing servers, 
And uh, if everybody adopts one you know, object model or one you know, IoT <coughs> framework, then we have you know, ubiquitous interoperability. But the reality is we have multiple of these frameworks. And so in order to get an interoperability, we have to introduce the notion of translation. Translation happens at the, at the semantic level or the information model level. And so we need, uh, the, we need something that performs that translation. And, and often that comes in the form of a gateway or a bridge or something, some other device that sits between these networks. All right, so here's another view of where the translation gateway fits. You can see there's a network A that is built around one IoT uh, framework approach, a network B, which is built, in, built around another IoT framework approach, and then you have this notion of a client, clients and servers within the network, and they're able to communicate with, with clients and servers in the opposing network through the gateway. And the gateway essentially introduces this notion of a virtual server or virtual client that connects to uh, sort of its opposing uh, virtual component. So a virtual client uh, talks to a virtual server. A virtual server talks to a virtual, uh, in, uh, virtual client. And the translation happens in between while on the gateway. So at the end of the day, you can get an end-to-end -end interoperability solution where uh, an application using a client on one network in network B is able to talk to a server in network A as if it was talking to one of its, one of its own devices. And so the whole idea here is to provide this illusion that the, the clients and servers in network B are, are sort of magically uh, populated in network A and vice versa. Now the interesting thing about about uh, what's introduced by this, by this translation gateway is that from a vendor perspective, vendors are not only have to update their, their device, which in this case is the server or the client, they also need to update the virtual component that's represented in the gateway. So there's really two targets of update when we're talking about uh, translation gateways. And of course, uh, if there's a second vendor for each one of these virtual devices, then the, there may be you know, uh, another ven other vendors for other, other uh, clients and servers and in, in other networks also have to perform an update. So from the perspective here of the gateway provider, there's, uh, there's a, a dependency on the, 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 the vendors from both network A and the vendors of network B are, are both depending on the gateway to provide you know, this translation, for, for hosting this translation uh, of the virtual devices. <clears throat> now there's another, another aspect to think about here in terms of uh, update, and that is if the virtual, de virtual uh, uh, device on, on, uh, uh, in one network is updated to provide, say, new functionality, then that might imply that the virtual device uh, on the, in the other network that's trying to talk to it might also need to be updated in order to take advantage of that new functionality as well. And so you may, you, there, may, there may, may need to be some coordination between vendors A and vendors B in order to get their new functionality realized in this model. So the whole point here is to help illustrate that there's some additional complexity when we have to work through gateways. All right. so. A gateway is not limited to a single uh, network. They can, they can translate between multiple networks. And so uh, and when, when I say network, I'm referring to a network that's built around an, an IoT framework. Okay? So think you know, OCF, Allseen Alliance, 1M to M, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So for every, for every, for every, one, for every uh, IoT framework, there is potentially another, another target for the the application in, in one network to, to talk to the server in the other network. Uh, so you can sort of think through some of the, com some of the uh, combinatorics here. Um, so let's talk about uh, updates. So there could be vendors that are providing the application component while other vendors are providing the, the framework component. 
and, and so those, each of those components need to be updated. There can be a, a, a large number of devices, so think different vendors of different types of devices, whether they're lights or thermo thermostats or switches or pumps or whatever they are. They may all have different vendors, and so there's, you know, the gateway is essentially instantiating a virtual instance of every one of those kinds of devices. Okay, so think about the complexity of your IoT networks and how many devices there are, and then map that onto a gateway. There's potentially lots of virtual devices on a gateway. Now, the other, the other point here to note is the, the impact of update on the gateway becomes really important in terms of the latencies that are, that are introduced through the update mechanism. <clears throat> start counting, the, counting up the, the numbers of things there. there there's, there's potential for, for all, the, all of the uh, combinatorics to add up. <clears throat> okay, so I think what this means is that gateways need to be designed for availability. That should be a primary design objective. Uh, if you sort of try to calculate what the mean time to failure is, uh, essentially what you're saying is the rate of a failure of network of devices in network A is going to be uh, a function of the rate of failure in network B and network C, and, and if, there's a, if there's D, E, and F, whatever, it, all of those add to the uh, MTBF of this of the entire system because this gateway is providing this this fundamental translation function between all of the networks. So uh, the, the question here then is. What if an update requires a reboot of the gateway? That essentially means that the gateway becomes this uh, central point of failure, and so the network, the, the overall network, sort of the, the combination of all these networks, uh, becomes the, really the, 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 the point of failure for, for the entire network, and uh, that becomes uh, you know, a main concern from, a, from an availability perspective. So really the question is, do updates require the, the server to reboot? Now, if you're familiar with, with any of the existing update mechanisms, they, they, they tend to rely on uh, a, re a reboot. Uh, so that, that could be a challenge. So it's, and, and it gets worse, so let's consider also the, cons the, the case where there may be different versions of the IoT framework, and those, the gateway may need to host multiple versions. Uh, so there may be, in this, in this example, there's version one of the, of the, of the blue class of framework, and uh, then, the, then the, an update happens and, and introduces version two. And so now the translator has to be versioned, right? So we get, we get a second version of the translator in order to map uh, uh, the, the, the different versions between the different IoT frameworks. <coughs> and of course, if you add another network, then that also uh, uh, potentially updates the, the translator. So you have translator code that's sort of fundamental part of the gateway that also needs to be updated. And so you, you add to our equation here that the availability of the gateway itself is now another dimension of our MTVF function. <coughs> Um, so you might say, well, hey, I can fix that problem by introducing new gateways, and certainly you can do that, uh, but just keep in mind that for each one of those gateways, there's the complexity that all of the other, that, that the single gateway has. Now we multiply that complexity by three, and now we're really complicated in terms of update. So now as a, as a device vendor, I have my, my, my physical device that I have to update, I also have to update the virtual device on, on all of the gateways that, the, that, are, that are in deployment. And if, the, and if the gateway is unreliable, and the solution to that unreliability is that we introduce more gateways, now as a vendor I have to somehow make sure that my, my virtual device image gets properly updated on all of those instances of the gateway. So this seems like complexity that's, that's uh, difficult to manage. So what are some of the solutions? Uh, I think there, there, are, there are lots of potential solutions. Uh, 
but uh, certainly solutions for the gateway where you can do some sort of dynamic update of the gateway such that it doesn't have to ever reboot is a great, um, uh, a, a great uh, opportunity here. I know that in the academic community there's some discussion around dynamic software update and some interesting tools that, uh, and techniques that basically do stack modification and uh, other things that essentially allow updates to happen in real time so the, so the, uh, the kernel doesn't ever reboot. And I, but this talk isn't about that. Uh, uh, I think that's a whole other talk, maybe for another day. But just to, just to point that out, this really is what is going to be is the kind of technology that we're going to need in order for these gateways to be successful. All right, so uh, another aspect of update has to do with, with securing the updates and managing the keys that are associated with that update. So uh, I'm going to kind of dive into that a little bit right now. So uh, just so you understand the terminology or, uh, here, I'm, I'm using, I'm using a k to the minus 1 to represent an asymmetric private key. The k is essentially representing the public key, an asymmetric public key. And then square brackets denotes signing. So when you look at kind of what we have here, this, the left-hand side of the screen is, is trying to represent essentially the existing uh, solution in terms of how we manage security uh, for update. And, and it's, quite, it's fairly simple in the sense that a vendor has a, his own uh, private key, and he uses that private key to sign his update package. So there's some signature, and uh, whether it's in a package or whether it's streamed sort of doesn't matter. The point is he has, a, he has his key that he uses to sign that package, and then his key is also embedded in the device in some sort of secure storage so that when the, the package arrives, it can be validated. Now, th this works because the vendor controls the manufacturer of the device and has access to the device. Uh, during manufacturing and can, can embed his key in the device in some secure storage. There's a variety of different ways to do that, and every vendor, many vendors have their own proprietary ways of embedding keys in hardware. Okay? <clears throat> On the left-hand side, we have the gateway, and the point here is when the vendor is now trying to update the gateway, he has to produce a, an update package. Uh, only this update package is a virtual image, not the, not the device image. Uh, this is particularly appropriate for the, the scenario where you have a single image uh, device, a constrained device that has a single image. Uh, you can't use that image to update the gateway because it's, the gateway can only deal with virtual, uh, sort of these virtual devices, okay? So there's something that, is, that sort of represents the device at the, at the IoT framework object level and ignores the, everything underneath it, okay? Because it's not, it's not running on that constrained environment when it's on the gateway. So that's, a, that's a, essentially a different uh, image that needs to be signed and packaged and installed. Now the installer has to uh, essentially provide the verification key to the gateway in order for this verification to work. And what that implies is that, the, that somehow the, the installer is able to provision his, his uh, public key into the secure storage of the gateway, uh, but the gateway has to approve it. In other words, somehow the gateway's key has to sign the a vendor's key in order for that trust relationship to be established properly. And so that's a separate, think of that as a separate installation step where you, the, the vendor not only has to install the package, he also has to install the key that verifies the package. Okay? And so that gets into uh, the, nec uh, you know, the next sort of question of how, how, how do we do that efficiently. Now from a gateway vendor perspective, if you're happy to be a gateway vendor, the problem is essentially that you need to establish a trust relationship with every vendor. Okay, so and again, this is not just every vendor in your favorite LT framework, it's every vendor for every 
IoT framework for which you intend to provide translation. So this, this potentially could be uh, all devices. Okay, so as a, as a gateway vendor, you want to maximize your value. You want to be able to translate from all possible IoT frameworks. Uh, you're going to need to have trust relationships with all possible uh, device vendors. Okay. And keeping in mind that vendors change their keys and also vendors change. They, they, they come and go, they go out of business. There's a lot of uh, uh, you know, dynamism in the whole vendor community. So as a gateway provider, you have to deal with all of that. Okay, so what are, what, let's kind of review here. What are the, some of the essential uh, features or capabilities for, uh, for some sort of scalable update mechanism that involves gateways? So first of all, automation. This, this should be obvious. Uh, we, we, there needs to be some sort of notification that an update is available. So you can imagine all the vendors are, are working feverishly to update their products. And so as a gateway uh, provider, you want to know when those updates are available. Um, there should be some sort of install package customization so that the, the uh, image, you can tell the difference between an image that's, that's aim, that, that is targeting a physical device versus one that's targeting a virtual device. Um, and there should be some mechanism for rollback uh, and that should be automated. So if, 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 the, if for example, the uh, installation fails, you can respond to it appropriately. Uh, think in terms of the complexity for rollback when you're trying to coordinate, <coughs> excuse me, when you're trying to coordinate the installation of both the physical device and the virtual device. If one of those fails, then you got to roll back the other one, okay, and vice versa. That's an added level of complexity uh, we should be uh, concerned about. In terms of security, uh, images need to be signed. It doesn't make sense to, from a gateway vendor's perspective to install a virtual device that potentially is going to introduce some kind of security uh, malware into their gateway and bring it down. So they're going to require signed images. Uh, there needs to be a root of trust in the devices. This is, and so this, this applies both to, to physical devices but also to the virtual devices uh, that has to be there. And then there's this notion of a trusted image repository. There needs to be some place to, to store the, the images that the <coughs> gateway needs to install. And, and again, the installers themselves need to be trusted. So whatever, whatever uh, solution that the vendor is providing to the gateway to install the virtual devices, uh, the gateway vendor needs to trust that. Uh, testing and validation is also an important component uh, if you think about vendor, vendors uh, uh, typically test their devices, uh, they, they're going to have the added uh, responsibility of, of, of testing the virtual device as well and making sure that that interoperability is uh, uh, the interoperability promise of working through a, 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 a gateway that does translation is, you know, a supported uh, capability. Uh, <clears throat> we also need to uh, establish some open source technology for doing things like having common images, so bundles, packages, manifests, you know, whatever that is, we, we really need to have, we need to reduce the number of choices that are out there so that uh, the, the, we don't introduce un unnecessary complexity just in the way that we create, um, you know, update images. And I know that's, everybody has an opinion of which, which you know, package and package manager that, that they like, but Every time we have a, you know, a different one, there's, that just add, adds some complexity that makes it more difficult to uh, ensure that you've, you, you know, you've addressed all of the corner cases. <coughs> and uh, messaging in the, at the framework layer is also another area uh, where we could look at having open source technologies address uh, the need here. In, in other words, uh, when, when you look at the, uh, many of the update mechanisms, they introduce their own sort of framework layer for messaging. And uh, so in the context of IoT frameworks, they're defining essentially a messaging framework for, for, for achieving that connectivity. And so it doesn't seem to, to me, it doesn't make sense to have 
multiple uh, you know, different types of messaging frameworks, especially ones that are, that are focused narrowly on, hey, here's how I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do over the air updates using this new type of messaging framework when the whole goal of the industry for interoperability is to standardize around a few uh, you know, IoT frameworks. And, uh, and, then, and then another another component here is essentially an image repository. And I'm gonna go into more detail about that in future slides. Was there a question? Okay, if you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll call on you. Okay, all right, so suggestions for update scalability. Uh, so, uh, I think a cloud, you know, the, the assertion here is that a cloud repository is essential in order to scale the complexity. We need to find some way to reduce the, the apparent complexity from the perspective of the gateway and from the perspective of the vendors. So a great way to do that is introduce uh, a cloud service and uh, hide a lot of that complexity. So here's a, a suggestion for how we might do that. Uh, if we have a cloud repository that's built around a publish subscribe model, Essentially, you can have the vendors be represented as publishers into the cloud. They publish their images, and then the installers are the subscribers. They then, you know, consult the cloud when there's a when a new version of, of a vendor's virtual device or physical device is available. They then get notified through public subscribe, <clears throat> and they can react then by installing the appropriate sort of updated image to the appropriate device, whether it's a physical device or a virtual device on a gateway. So what you see here on this slide is uh, just sort of a, an example is vendors one and three are publishing to version 1.1 of a particular uh, um, framework. And the installer one is the one that's installing. And it's installing both, uh, both uh, device A and device B and it's installing into you know, both the virtual, de the virtual device as well as the physical device, and they all happen to be uh, you know, of the blue, the, the sort of the blue flavor of, of the IoT framework. <clears throat> Vendor two, on the other hand, is, is uh, building a device that can speak on all, uh, on three different IoT frameworks, uh, and so it's, it, it has a little bit tougher job in that it needs to provide it needs to publish to, to each of those topics for, for, for each of the flavors, and then the installer that needs to be able to uh, install each of the flavors on, on the, uh, virtu both the virtual and the physical devices, okay? So you get a sense for, for what this slide is re trying to represent here. Now, uh, keep in mind this diagram doesn't deal with what happens if there's installation failure and how rollback works. That's added complexity that needs to be considered. All right, so now let's talk about key management of the cloud repository. So on the far left, you'll see essentially how things work today. This is sort of simplified version of how update works today. You have a vendor, provides his updates to some sort of repository that then gets uh, applied to the device and the device has this a public key for which it is able to, to verify the update. Now, <clears throat> some vendors uh, go out of business and that leaves their devices that are out in deployment and someone really ought to update them. Some of the ways that they deal with that is they license their, uh, their updates to uh, another outsourcer and so they essentially delegate through, through uh, key signing, they delegate to the outsourcer uh, uh, and so Essentially what that means is the outsourcer uh, uh, key is signed by the vendor key and then the updates are provided by the outsourcer but can be signed by the, uh, uh, by the vendor key, okay? So essentially the device, doesn't, the, the device doesn't have to change in terms of its, its trust anchor. Uh, it can still verify the, the outsourcer's provided update. <coughs> So that's an accommodation, but it doesn't. But as an accommodation, it really doesn't scale much better than than the current model, okay? Where vendors provide their own private keys, 
and uh, embed their uh, trust anchors in their own devices. So in terms of a cloud update model, essentially what, what we're suggesting is that the cloud repository provider has its key and that the uh, certainly the gateway device will embed the cloud repository uh, public key as a trust anchor in its uh, secure storage. And the, when the uh, updates are provided to the cloud repository, they are signed by the cloud. And so the cloud then becomes a trusted entity in delivering those updates. Uh, but what this does is it really sim simplifies this notion of root of trust, okay? So every device has this one, this one uh, uh, repository trust anchor, then th th there's some simplification that happens there. So let's take a look at key management uh, scalability. There's actually a couple of approaches that we can look at. There's the PKI approach, which many of you may be familiar with. The idea of PKI is there's a hierarchy of CAs and that there's a root CA that everybody sort of knows and trusts and you, you basically embed the, the root CA uh, key on the device and then uh, you build a certificate chain and at the very bottom layer of that certificate chain, uh, this is the vendor CA, if you will. He is going to create a key that is his signing key, his signing key for his update and then his, uh, the vendor's uh, the vendor's update key, uh, which is highlighted in purple here, that's signed by the, the, the vendor's CA, which is this lower layer. There may be, there may be multiple intermediate CAs, uh, but then you get to the, to the sort of the first level and the, and the root level CA. Okay, so this is just a bunch of signatures over keys until you get to the key that signs the update. Uh, that's typically how PKI works. <coughs> Some things to note here, uh, the verification essentially requires all keys, so there could be uh, four or more verify operations uh, uh, for each update. The, uh, the, 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 uh, tr the, the root CA has to be trusted by everybody. Uh, this is interesting because it means that there is some outside entity that's providing a key that, that a vendor is putting into their device and they have no control over that vendor. They have no control over this, uh, you know, the, the CA provider. So if something went wrong, say their keys got compromised or whatever, they're taking risk, they're sharing risk uh, uh, of their product line with this other vendor. So from a, from a, some, from a business risk perspective, you have to think about uh, whether or not that CA provider is putting uh, as much you know, investment in protecting those keys as you're putting into your your uh, investment in your product line and in your product. Okay. So if we take compare that with the uh, cloud repository approach, essentially the uh, cloud repository has an update that's signed by the vendor. The vendor, the cloud, then signs uh, countersigns the update with the uh, cloud repository key. So you see this again highlighted in purple, the countersigning of the cloud key uh, of the update that's also signed by the vendor. And what this means is when you install, the verifier could just verify with one key. Either they verify with the cloud repository key or they verify with their, with their own vendor key. Either one can work and you only need to do one uh, there's only only one verify is needed. You just have to pick which key is appropriate. And m many vendors are going to include the their vendor key anyway because the the other the other types of updates, for example, firmware updates or or kernel updates, may be uh, something that they use a different up they update infrastructure for, uh, which they control. So their vendor key is going to be there anyway. Okay. So the expectation here is that, that each vendor is going to uh, establish some trust in the cloud repository. So it's similar in, in that sense with the PKI approach, but it's the cloud, uh, the cloud repository as an entity that's focusing on sort of being, being a meaningful, meaningful participant in, in uh, updates. And so uh, the, 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 
the business conditions may uh, suggest that the cloud repository provider is going to make the appropriate investment. Okay. And of course, the question is, do we really need the PKI uh, root key in, in this scenario? And that's an open question. I don't know. All right. So let's take a look at, uh, you know, do, do these uh, IoT um, framework repositories exist today? This isn't a uh, complete list, but there's a couple of them that are interesting. There's uh, one called Open uh, TDT. So this is, I think this is, uh, the T is, is for translator uh, uh, to things. And the idea here is that, is that from Open TDT perspective, there are these schemas that are created by, by industry providers, so vendors of, of devices will create virtual devices that are built around a schema, and then they'll contribute that schema to the Open TDT repository. Um, and it's mostly driven by standards organizations, so think of things like OCF, uh, All Scene Alliance, and so forth. They're providing, they're essentially defining the schemas that are uh, contributed to the, the, to the Open TDT repository. Uh, developers can create their own translators and schemas if they, uh, as well. Um, that's okay too. Uh, translators can run on you know, devices, cloud-connected things, gateways. They can sort of run on anything. Uh, assuming, you know, given that you have the, 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 the IoT framework component underneath them. Okay. Uh, another interesting one is the Oscar bundle repository. Uh, this is essentially bundles of OSGI objects. The OSGI, uh, it's a sort of an OSGI defined manifest that goes with that. Uh, there's, it offers programmatic access to, the, to a web repository. Uh, however, uh, developers uh, can submit bundles to the repository, but there's no sort of automated way to do that. It's all sort of manually uh, put together. Uh, so there's still work to be done to make it automated, but this, this seems to be the type of choices that are available today. Uh, the, the, one of the challenges with Open TDT is that schemas need to be standardized, so maybe there isn't the promise of vendor differentiation, maybe may more difficult to get to. Uh, in the case of OSGI, essentially it sort of lacks this developer automation that's needed to make it scale. Okay, so, uh, the, and of course, uh, the other sort of main from the perspective of security, uh, uh, there's still a bit of key management that's that's ignored by by any of them. All right, so let's talk conclusions. Essentially, reliance on IoT frameworks implies the need for translation. This is just, this, this is sort of seems to be where the industry is going, and uh, uh, given that, gateway architectures uh, need to add some some sort of uh, support for dealing with the complexities of, of that update brings. And, uh, but update automation uh, is needed to ensure scalability. There are a lot of challenges that are facing us in terms of achieving that scalability. Um, but certainly one of the ways that, that uh, hardware vendors can help out is to provide some support for you know, embedding of, of trust anchors and keys and protecting those keys. That seems to be one of the, one of the fundamental components to all of this. <clears throat> so with that, uh, open to questions or comments uh, that others may have. Yes? Yeah, uh, that was a, that's a great observation, and I'm not trying to advocate one one sort of business model over another, uh, uh, but certainly the, 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 there is the possibility that vendors can go out of business and they don't support their products any longer, and the question to the industry is what do we do about that? Um, one possible solution is 
is that, be, that presents a business opportunity for somebody to go and, and, and support them. Uh, but in the absence of that, then what, what does the industry, you know, what's the right thing for the industry to do? Uh, from, from a gateway vendor perspective, it's, it, it's sort of one of the options for the gateway vendors to say, oh, well, I can't support this uh, translation device any longer because the, the vendor's not supporting it. That creates essentially uh, maybe maybe a, a, a useful control point for for uh, preventing that device from from creating you know, creating a problem because they can just remove the virtual device from their gateway and now that connectivity is not allowed. Sort of a way of turning off the physical device. Um, but you know that ideally that's not the best answer. Ideally there's there's some way for the uh, those devices to to be updated by by you know somebody who wants to pick up support for it. Other questions, thoughts. This was this talk was intended to get you thinking. It's not trying to provide a uh, you know an absolute solution, but really it's it's something that as an industry we have to be aware of and try and try and work through it and figure out what, what's the best way to address this. I, you know, I think we're making great progress with over-the-air updates and so forth. But those that you know, everything that I've seen so far at this conference, in terms of uh, update, is focusing on update just just the physical device. And there should be some thought given to updating the virtual devices and working with gateways and helping them scale. Okay. Comments, questions. If not, uh, thank you very much.